But today we're going to talk about gender and social class in sports. Uh, and we touched upon that last time uh, in regards to social class. But um, uh, but we're going to go a bit deeper into that today. And since you are so few, it, uh, it actually gives us the opportunity to have more of a dialogue. Okay? So I hope that um, you will uh, participate. Although, um, even though this is taped, your comments don't get <laughs> on, the, um, on the web. So just so you know that. And uh, also, um, if you have comments, you can always say it in Norwegian and it will translate. Okay? Now, um, gender and social class. Why is that important? We are um, thinking that uh, although we say that sport is equal, everybody has the right to do sports, You've, you already wrote about that in your, in your uh, coursework. And although we, we say that, we've in Norway, in Europe, we're we at least we think that we are quite advanced when it comes to those things, such as inclusion. There are still um, challenges when it comes to the inclusion of gender and social class, as we saw last time. Uh, and we're going to look at that today. So basically, uh, we will have this from a Norwegian point of view, as we already <laughs> had done a lot. Uh, I don't know about that much about uh, French sport, for instance, or st the statistics. And I would, would think that it might be a little bit different. Uh, I would appreciate it if you have uh, some ideas or some thoughts about that during the lecture. Because in Norway, we are um, we more or less think, oh, there's no change between girls and boys when it comes to sport. There is, but there's no real change. I think that you might think so too. I don't know. Um, but there might, we don't have to go so far away from our borders where you can actually see the difference. So it will be interesting to see how it is in France. We're going to look at the female participation on different levels of Norwegian sport. We're looking at this uh, social inequality. What creates social inequality in sport and why is it important to be aware of this? Uh, we are going to say something about the relation between physical activity and social class. What does statistics say? This is down your alley, actually, because this is sociology, social anthropology. So, <laughs> And then uh, we're going to look at sport as an integration arena. Did any of you write about that uh, in, your, um, in your coursework? Immigrants, inclusion in sports. Yeah? So we're going to look at this. Uh, how can sport be, or uh, is sport excluding some groups from participation? Because we say that sport is a good integration tool. Uh, is it always a good integration tool? So we're going to look at that as well. If you have any questions along, please ask. Now, first we're going to talk about gender. And often when we talk about gender, uh, I think I said this in the sport history class too, when we talk about gender, we automatically think women. But gender is, of course, both men and women. Uh, we have a lot of studies, both on women or women gen as gender studies and also about masculinities. And in sport, we have, uh, there are studies, of course, on both sides. But it's easier or it's easy to think, when we think about gender, unequal um, inequality in sports related to gender, we think women. Because historically, and that's how it has been. Sport wasn't for women in the beginning. It was for men. And it was men, basically, that created sports and did sports. Uh, so that when we talk about sport, it's often this male or masculine ideal, which is in the back of our head. And we often see that girls have to fit in this ideal, rather than actually sports being 
for girls. Uh, and when we see gender research, and especially about female or women in sport, it's often about this women having to adapt to some cer uh, certain norms that is not created for them initially. We will see that in this uh, research that you also had on your reading list today. Uh, anyway, um, NIF is taking this whole idea of, of women in sports seriously. It's part of their ideology, which is sport for, sport for all. So women is obviously <laughs> a part of that. Um, so in uh, 2007, they appointed a women's committee that wanted to look at women issues in sport in NIF, in the NIF system. How is women integrated in NIF and what are the, the challenges of female integration? And the goal, as we can see here, was to increase female memberships in NIF. It's not bad, it's almost 40%. But the ideal is to have an equal amount of girls and boys, men and women playing sports. So, uh, we need to look at these statistics in order to hopefully increase. We're going to see what, what is the problem here. Why are there so few or fewer girls in sports? And also, and this was even more, or no, I, w I won't say even more importantly, because I, I don't know, <laughs> but it's also equally important to increase the number of active female leaders. Because as we will see, on the leadership side, females or women are very, very um, low or um, a lot fewer than the men. I was... Um, I think it's quite interesting in this context too, but now you're so few <laughs> in class and most of you don't go on the sport, or none of you go on the sport management course. But it's, um, it's always interesting to see the class and it's mostly boys or men, your men. <laughs> it's mostly men and maybe two, three, four uh, girls that are applying for in our, in, uh, in our sport management class. And we're thinking, why is that? Uh, where are there so few girls who want to be female leaders in sports? At least here in our, hi, here in our institution. But now there are not so many to answer that question. But it's, uh, it's still in the back of our heads. Why, why is this? Is being a male is, or is being a leader in sport more appealing to a man? Or is it because we, we automatically think that it's men that are leaders in sports? Why is this? Now, <coughs> this um, background or this um, initiative uh, resulted in a report, Gender or Changing Genders or Gender and Change, whatever, um, about uh, the, um, the status of, um, of gender in Norwegian sports by two researchers. And what they found was this. First of all, when we look at the activity number in the adult population, voksne folk, not children, but adults, uh, we can see that adult women are more physically active than adult men. They're more active. Um, but when it comes to membership in NIF, in the um, organization, there are more men than women. So being a member of NIF or being active doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that you're a member. But in, in, um, in general, women are more active. How are, how are adult women and men active? What do they do? For instance, do they play football? Some do. When they're asked what they do, uh, they are, um, uh, for instance, hiking, walking, uh, running, those kinds of things. Uh, relatively easy to organize for themselves. Also so social uh, gathering, social event or sort of event. And they prefer more or less the same activities. Uh, those e re relatively easy things to organize. 
And of course, also when you ask people about their activity level. We saw that last time uh, all um, the adult population is required to be active at least 30 minutes a day from the uh, uh, National Health uh, Institution. Uh, but when you ask people if they're active, what is it to be active? There are different, um, I would say if I was active, walking home wouldn't be activity to me. I would have to do something to increase my, my pulse and I have to do something, you know? Maybe that's the same for you when you are active or sports people. Whereas I had um, a colleague who did the similar research in America asking, are you active? How, how much are you active? And what state your activity? And then there was this, uh, I don't know if it was a person or, or at least a category, saying driving for pleasure. That was an activity in the field of physical activity. So def defining what is it to be active is actually also a bit difficult. But anyway, they prefer more or less the same activities for more or less the same reasons. Uh, however, um, there are more women, uh, or much of it is to be healthy, for instance, or to be social, uh, have a social arena, to experience, um, um, what do you say, experience um, the well-being. But there are more women than men that has more of, a, of an um, instrumental uh, reason, like physical appearance, etc. cetera, um, reason to be active. The previous slide also showed this, almost 40% of the members in NIF are women. 60% is men. Female membership varies greatly from national sport federation or to from sport to sport. Could you give me a sport that you think would be a high female percentage? Handball, yeah. I'm not actually quite sure how the how it is, but it's more women than men. That's true. Yeah. Other sports? Gymnastics, Gymnastics definitely. Other things? Horse. Horseback riding. I'm not quite sure actually. Um, but uh, maybe you can find it out. <laughs> uh, how about male? Male-dominated sports. Soccer, yeah, there I, I would think there are more male than women, although the amount of women is quite high there as well. Rugby, hmm? rugby. rugby definitely. We don't actually have rugby in Norway, <laughs> but we do. Uh, is it part of the American? It's not an American sport, but is it part of the American? Uh, oh, yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah? I'm not sure. I think rugby and cricket are outside of that. We have one association which is called the Association of American Sports, which has <laughs> cheerleading, uh, baseball, American football. Those are very small. Sp no, cheerleading is actually quite big in Norway, but uh, the others are quite small. Anyway, we have this uh, idea of what is most women and most men. And that is, as we started initially, that is also kind of a, uh, we will look at that later. We have this idea of what is female and what is male, maybe? That is also guiding um, the direction that people choose when it comes to choosing sports. But, because these stats aren't that, aren't that bad, I mean, 40% women in Norwegian sport is not bad. But now, this is one of the things that NIF um, defines as a problem. As coaches and referees, women are underrepresented. Amongst elite or top coaches in Norway, you only have 8% women. That is not much, including women's teams. How many of you have had l women coaches? Maybe girls have had, no? Mostly men. When you were 12, we had a woman? You were playing humble? Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Well, actually, 
for change, it's almost 50-50% girls and boys here. So, <laughs> so uh, obviously, girls often have more women coaches than boys do. But this is a, a very common uh, or uh, a recognized problem in sport. And I, I would think that it's the same in, in France. In, uh, in top, uh, top sports or elite, or elite sports, you won't find many female co coaches. Now we have this gender quote, quota rule. And you have that in France too, I, I guess, I don't know. Uh, saying that in every board, uh, there should be at least 40% women. At least that's one of those, um, I would say, important, um, important uh, gender equity uh, steps that has been taken in Norway in order to try to equal uh, women and men when it comes to decision making. Um, and NIF is also taking this very seriously. So in, in, the, in each board of every sport federation, also like the um, general board of, of NIF, you have almost uh, or around 40% women representation, female representation. Um, and also this, this is uh, also relevant as we can see in sports clubs on the local level. They're taking this seriously. Uh, so when it comes to board, board activity, it is following those guidelines. It's not, it's not entirely equal, but it's following. Also in the general board. But as leaders of these uh, confederations and boards, women are also very much underrepresented. Only 18%, uh, and this is from 2008, nine. so probably it's changed a little bit because it's changing every now and then. But we see only 18% of presidents of sports federations. And there are also very few female leaders in sport teams on the district levels. So they are involved and they are very involved in sports on like grassroots sports. Um, you will probably know from your own sport clubs, there are lots of women doing volunteer work and doing all these committees. But as leaders, they're not there, really, not there. And that's why I think it's so fascinating to look at the, the class, not this class, but <laughs> uh, um, the normal class. Then you will see that there are so few women compared to men. Why are there so few women um, wanting to be leaders in sport? And many researchers have looked at this. And uh, they have asked uh, the questions, why are, why are female underrepresentation so high? Um, why, why do we have this uh, female stereotype? I think this is quite a good um, good cartoon because it's it's typical. You have a female secretary. She dress up nicely. That's her job, and she serves this guy <laughs> with his golf clubs or coffee or whatever. Uh, but it's um, that's the role often that the female has or women have in yeah in general actually, but uh, not least in sport. And why is it like this? There's this uh, researcher from uh, Trondheim. She has conducted a study on this. And uh, her she tries to show how, how what we think or perceive to be female or male leadership and gender contributes to, to you, un you understand, to sustain this structure, to sustain this role of females in sport or in, as leaders in sport. Because it's the way or the mindset that we have. It's the way we think about this that makes this sustain. And many studies, as she, she shows in her article, many studies of successful leaders, when they, they look at these, it's, not, it's, it's um, um, not necessarily on male leaders, but studies of successful leaders shows that they are. And then you get these words heroic, masculine, confident, 
brave, tough, independent, blah, blah, blah. And this, these are all what we call masculine ideals. So the successful leader has these masculine ideals. And then for a woman, that's what research say, for a woman to enter and be a successful leader, she has to take on these masculine ideals. She has to adapt to something that is already set. A woman can be mas or, or be uh, confident, heroic, uh, brave and tough as a leader, no problem. But she needs to adapt to these norms that are masculine. I read this article once and the, the title of the article was, um, <laughs> I can't really remember, but it's, it was uh, um, a strict or a good leader or a, a strict leader a strict male leader is uh, fair, and a strict female leader is a bitch. That was the, the title. Because that's when women take on these, you're often uh, treated as you're being uptight, and you're being unfair, and you're being bitchy. So we have these stereotypes of how women and male men are, and this also applies to leadership in sport. And then when they study gender and leadership, they look at women and they say, oh, what can women contribute? And then you always have these complementary qualifications, as they say. Okay, you have the masculine here, but as female leaders, they have feelings. They show emp em empathy. And they, um, they view, they are democratic. And, they, and you have all these female quali um, qualities, that they call it. Um, and that's what it is to be a woman leader or a female leader. So, and, and this is uh, problematic in the sense that uh, the norm, the normal thing, the reality, the good leaders are here. So if you want to be a good leader, you need to adapt. Basically, that's what um, previous research say. Now, this uh, woman, Jürgen Hovden, she has uh, looked at this from a Norwegian perspective. She interviewed 16 board members, equal number of male and female, from eight large national sport federations. All of these were relatively similar in terms of education. Age, more or less, the women were a bit younger. And of course, there was a big age span but uh, they were a bit younger. And experiences uh, in sports, the girls that she interviewed, or the women that she interviewed, they had slightly less um, experience from sports, uh, or from leadership in sports, or board. And that's also very representative, because uh, often in these peri periods when you have children, or, st or um, yeah, especially when you have children, you, especially the women, um, they uh, involve less in those kinds of matters. And also, uh, this is very similar to, <laughs> to uh, general statistics or whatever. All these sports federations were led by middle-aged male presidents. Higher education, good income in their 50s probably. Um, all these informants, all, that, all those that she interviewed, they looked at female leaders and their potentials. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and they looked at it from a gender-specific point of view, as we just talked about. Uh, they could make a positive or negative difference uh, based on their gender. Um, compared to these general norms, the norm that is running in the sports organization, which are masculine. But there are also different views, as we shall see, depending on who answered. The girls or the women and the younger men interviewed were less conservative, not surprisingly maybe, than the older men when it came to looking at 
leadership, leadership uh, challenges. And they, um, she singled out, uh, or singled out two different uh, ways of viewing women as leaders in a, an organization. Either that women could create or make a negative difference or a positive difference. And there were three arguments on each that dominated. First of all, the negative different, women, leadership, negative different. Women are more hesitant when they make decisions and they, they use, use more time to decide. They're more like vinglete. Um, I don't know the word in English. Unsecure, you need to like scan all the the different opinions in the room and okay, yeah, yeah, we can do that or we can do that. A uh, bit more hesitant. They claim that women are less ambitious, less goal and competition oriented. Um, and also the competence. Uh, they are less strict and they don't have the strategic competence. They're not, they claim that male or men Knows the knows the um, knows the game, how to how to get somebody on your side by playing around. You know all those uh, strategic uh, little <laughs> moves that you made in order to to gain acceptance for your ideas. Women are more straightforward. We don't or they claim that they don't hide their agenda. Okay, this is how we do it. No, okay. And that was the negative difference because they were lack. They they don't they didn't have these um, these skills or these. Um, they didn't play the game that well. That was the idea of all this. But the difference between the informants were that the le the girls or the women, and the younger men, they said that this was actually a matter of the structure how the structure is built. Uh, the system allows this and this and this and that. The structures are like this. Whereas the older men say this is a female um, characteristics. This is because they are women that this happens. As one woman said that, I have never seen or heard about a man that is being complimented for his fantastic smile when you're in a meeting. As a female, you often are. You're often complimented for what you wear or how you look, how well you manage uh, leadership or being a leader and also having children. A man is very seldom, hello, <laughs> is very seldom complimented or valued or measured uh, on these terms. So being a woman um, in this um, environment is different than a man. But there were also positive um, differences, they claimed. Women have the ability to care. They could care about their, um, about their uh, employees. Um, they are much about demo democracy and leadership, building a team. Okay, we make a decision, I make a decision, but we made the decision, decision together. Um, and also, they claim that women have the ability to bring new controversial issues to the table. It's more, um, or they're less afraid of bringing these controversial issues to the table. But we see that all these things are based on gender, evaluated on the basis of gender, from a norm that is masculine. The norm is that you should be assist, assist, assistant, you should be strict, you should be tough, and you should be um, uh, goal-oriented, competition-oriented. All these masculine ideals, that define a successful leadership, these are what women are measured on the account of. 
So she says that, and also other researchers says that, as long as women are evaluated on the basis of their gender uh, more than men are, then men or the masculine norm is at the base. So research on leadership is often either on leadership or on gender leadership. Read women leadership. It's very seldom only on men or masculine studies about leadership. Usually it's either on leadership, read man, or it's about female leadership. So research needs to change their perspectives also to study men leadership. Because as long as one type of leadership is the norm, it's difficult to fit in. It's difficult to be a different type of leader in an environment which has a norm, which is this is how it's done. So, obviously, probably, it's less appealing or less interesting or less um, welcoming to try to be a leader in an environment which, where you have to adapt, rather than this environment being open for you too. Do you understand? Do you agree? This is just one research on this topic, but I think the findings are still important. And um, although we think that in sports, as, we, as I started with initially, in sports we think that we are equal. When I ask you, are we equal in Norwegian sports, are we? More or less. More or less? Are you equal in French sport? No? No? Um, I think that as well, especially as future leaders, it's important to be aware of this difference and aware of the fact that as long as we measure things on a masculine uh, base, sort of, it will be difficult to enter this, this field without being called uh, or without being a, a, a woman or um, a typical um, measured from your women qualities. I found this yesterday. Because being a woman in sports, practicing sports, is not necessarily all that different. This is, I, w I won't say that this is probably a big problem in Norway. But this is about, and she's an actor, actress, very interested in basketball, college basketball. So she's uh, tweeting quite a lot about the teams and uh, whatever. And the problem here is that when she expresses, as she says here, she's being called ridiculous things uh, on the basis of her gender. She's a girl, she's not supposed to mean anything about basketball. And this commentary or this uh, article is about, a sp or it's written by a sport historian that says that this is how it is. To mean something about sport as a woman, especially in America, is difficult. You're not supposed to know anything about that, especially when it's male dominated sports. If you're a woman and you have an opinion about American football, forget it. Even we see that in Norway. There was this woman uh, that is an expert commentary in football, soccer. It's only maybe two or three, Lise Klavenes. You've seen her commenting, um, yeah? She used to be a football, um, national football player on our soccer, or our national team. She's very, she was very good. And she's now, I think she's a lawyer. She's, got, she's very uh, well, <laughs> what do you say, well, well spoken for. She, she, um, she, and she's a very good commentator, uh, comment, what do you say, commentary? Commentator, commentator yeah, <laughs> she's a very good commentator, apparently, I'm not very um, good in football myself, but uh, the point is that she's, um, when, she, when she started, 
there were lots of, uh, of um, criticism towards her because she was a woman. She was going to comment on male football as a woman. She's probably better than most of them there. First of all, because she knows how to speak. I'm not saying that the rest of them don't, but, uh, but she, she speaks in a, <laughs> in a way that people understand. And she's uh, maybe, because she's a woman, she leaves out all those irrelevant things about people's looks that you often hear when you, for instance, listen to handball. I had a friend who was writing his PhD on <coughs> media and handball and the way they talk about girls um, and boys as handball players on TV. It's not entirely different actually because our girls team is doing very well internationally. Uh, so they actually don't um, give them that many um, gender typical um, what do we say? I, I'm <laughs> trying to find my words in English here. They don't actually give them uh, only on account of, of looks, for instance, that you often see and hear. But uh, there are still gender codes, more or less. But I think it's interesting still that, um, that uh, there, there is a difference outside of sports. Did you see this? This is actually a sanitary pad <laughs> commercial. So I'm not, um, but you see this film? Yeah? I'm trying to get this sound here. Did any of you see it? Like a girl, a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really If it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So, when they're in that vulnerable time between 10 and 12, how do you think <coughs> it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swim like a girl? Keep doing it because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl or kicking like a girl or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring and you're still getting the ball on time and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl. And that's not something that I should be ashamed of. So I'm gonna do it anyway. That's what they should do. If I asked you to, to run like a girl now, would you do it differently? I would run like myself. 
you like a chance to read it? Actually, in, before I showed you this, I should have asked you to run like a girl. I need like a girl. <laughs> this is just an example of uh, why working in sports, as sports leaders, coaches, teachers, although we think that we are equal, and we are more or less, there are still stereotypes, both when it comes to leadership and who we are and how we manage things and uh, et cetera, et cetera, but also uh, when it comes to children and youth, the way we talk and the way we speak and the way we, we act is important. So yes, we are equal, more or less, but there is still a lot to do, and we, and we have the same thing in Norway. I said it myself. Oh, she throws like a girl, for instance. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons why this is important. Because you, in your future work, some of you anyway, you're going to see these problems in real life. And you're going to have to know how to, what to, how to deal with it and why it is like it is. And to get your mindset there is important. I'll give you a break, 15 minutes, and then we'll talk about social difference or inequality.